Uh, good to see each of you here this morning. And uh, we're going to be uh, teaching again on the resurrection of Christ and uh, discussing that for a few weeks, um, being that this was the resurrection season. Um, again, uh, we, we kind of focus on that this time of the year, not that uh, we ought not focus on it every week because, uh, again, our faith uh, as Christians is uh, founded upon the resurrection of Christ. So it's important every week and every day, amen, not just uh, once a year. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll begin this. Fall in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you once again, Lord, for the opportunity we have to be in church this morning. We ask God that you bless each one that's come and those that may be on the way, those that are out sick today, pray you bless them. And Father, we pray you meet with us this morning in Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, last week we just had some introductory remarks about um, uh, the resurrection and uh, talked about the differences between believing it and not believing it. And um, about 100 years ago, 120 years ago, uh, there was a uh, movement called the Fundamentalist Movement. Uh, it was uh, in opposition to what was called the, the modernist or liberal religious movement. Uh, and what that means is that there's people who profess to be Christians, uh, yet they don't believe the fundamental doctrines of the Bible. Uh, they don't believe that Christ really died as a blood atonement for our sins. They don't believe that he literally rose from the dead. Uh, they spiritualize a lot of stuff. And uh, uh, many Christians go to a lot of Protestant churches, and uh, even today, that uh, think that people that are teaching and preaching in their churches believe the Bible and believe in the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and all these things. Uh, but a lot of these people are deceiving those people, and those people are deceived because uh, they don't really believe those things. Then you start talking to some people that go to churches that are uh, in that vein, and uh, you think they're talking about uh, the same thing you are, and then the more in-depth you get talking to some people, you find out that they don't really believe that Jesus Christ literally rose from the dead. Uh, and so that's what we're talking about. Because that's what uh, the foundation of Christianity rests upon is not just the death, but the resurrection. And uh, so we talk about uh, the Christian faith as being a historical faith. And we say that because we believe that what took place uh, <clears throat> in the life of Christ and the death and resurrection of Christ was uh, literal history. We think it's historical. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk about some, some observations here. Uh, that we could make, and we're going to start off with um, um, these things. Here we're going to talk about the testimony of history and uh, some quotes from some people who uh, uh, have studied these things out more in depth than a lot of people have. Uh, again, people want to refute Christianity. <clears throat> That's what the atheists are trying to do. And again, I said last week, uh, in the colleges, universities, it's been going on for a long time, um, and uh, it's, it's going on really... Um, I saw something this week where uh, I think it was Dr. Phil uh, was talking about uh, the, I think I guess it was 2008 or something. Uh, he said that's when the uh, smartphone dropped and everybody started getting smartphones. I guess everybody got a smartphone, right? And uh, he said that is probably one of the most um, uh, culture-changing things that's ever happened uh, in America. Uh, in this century and in the last hundred years. <clears throat> uh, one of the things that uh, changed the culture of America, they say, was the car, the automobile. Uh, people could get out and go and do things, and young people could get out and go do things and sneak <coughs> around and stuff like that, and it made a big difference. I mean, before the car, I mean, you really didn't have many, much arguments about, you know, the car keys and stuff like that, you know. You know they, they might need to take the buggy or something, you know, or the, go get a horse out of the barn or something. When the car came along, then it created some conflict and a lot with young people back in the 20s and 30s and things like that. I guess it still does today. Uh, but uh, he said the cell phone was the thing that really changed society. And uh, if you look on, and I know we, uh, depending on where you, how you look at things, <clears throat> but um, a lot of us look at that stuff and think, oh, I don't want nothing to do with it, nothing to do with it, whatever. And uh, that's, that's your business and stuff like that. And maybe life is easier without it. But our young people are hooked on this stuff. And there's all kinds of stuff out there that is attacking Christianity all the time. Uh, mocking Christianity, 
attacking it. Uh, our young people are listening to that, hearing that stuff, and they don't have to read in the book. They don't have to go to college to get it. All they got to do is go online and look at uh, uh, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, whatever, and they're going to be getting all kinds of feeds out there that's going to be attacking Christianity. And so we live in an age where uh, faith uh, is being attacked, Christian faith, and uh, science is being promoted as being the, uh, the be-all, end-all for everything. And um, so uh, they're trying to, the, the devil is using this stuff to get people's minds um, corrupted and uh, that kind of thing. So anyway, um, here's some testimony of some people here who believes it. And again, I said this before and you've heard me say it and you probably know what I'm saying. That is, you know, there's just as many smart people on our side as there is on the other side. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's who you believe. Uh, and of course, being a Christian, I believe the Bible. And so I'm going to side with that. I'm going to give the Bible the benefit of the doubt. And uh, so anyway, just some testimonies here. Um, here's a guy named uh, uh, Thomas Arnold. Um, he was the headmaster of Rugby College. Uh, wrote a three-volume history of Rome. Uh, he was uh, the chair of modern history at Oxford. So he's got credentials. He said this. He said, I have, been, uh, I have been used for many years to study the histories of other times and to examine the way the evidence of those who have written about them. And I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God hath given us that Christ died and rose again from the dead. So there's a man who is the chairman of modern history at Oxford who says he believes the resurrection is true, based on the evidence. Um, <clears throat> one of the men, uh, we talked about Westcott and Hort when it comes to Bible translations and stuff. Uh, Westcott said this, uh, he was an English scholar, he said this, taking all the evidence together, it is not too much to say that there is no historic incident better or more variously supported than the resurrection of Christ. Um, another man by the name of Dr. Paul Meyer, uh, he's the professor of ancient history at Western Michigan University, said this, If all the evidence is weighed and carefully and fairly, it is indeed justifiable, according to the canons of historical research, to conclude that the tomb in which Jesus was buried was actually empty on the morning of the first Easter. And no shred of evidence has yet been discovered in literary sources or archaeology that would disprove that statement. So, and Paul Meyer, he wrote a couple of books. He wrote one called The Flames of Rome. He called, he wrote one, Flames of Rome, and that's about Nero and Paul. And then he wrote another one, I can't think the name of it, um, which are really good books. They're, they're, they're written in a novel form, <clears throat> but they're, um, the, he, he's taken the, <clears throat> the uh, history uh, of uh, uh, Paul there in Acts, and the other one I think is out of the Gospels, I think, but I can't remember the name of it. Uh, but they go hand in hand with each other, and they're written in a novel form, but everything in there is based on Scripture. Um, and then when he speculates, you know where he's speculating, where he's adding some stuff. But uh, it really fleshes out uh, the uh, things concerning Christ uh, and early part of the church. Uh, he wrote another book, I believe, that called uh, A Skeleton in God's Closet. Does that sound interesting? A Skeleton in God's Closet. And I read that. It was a novel, and it's written. What the, 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 what the book is about is this. They um, discover that uh, Jesus Christ did not, they, they find the bones of Jesus Christ. That's what the claim is. Somebody finds the bones of Jesus Christ. Uh, it was transferred from the cross to the Joseph's tomb to someplace else. And uh, anyway, the whole thing is what would happen if they found the bones of Jesus Christ? What would that do to your faith? Uh, well, that would destroy it. That's the whole premise of the book. Um, and he's a Christian guy, and he believes in the resurrection. So uh, anyway, uh, he just he, he, he writes this book, and it's take place in modern times. And it's very interesting how he brings all this stuff out. And uh, eventually, you know, the truth comes out or whatever. I won't tell you how it ends. I won't spoil it. <laughs> but uh, a skeleton in God's closet. And part of the reasoning um, in the very beginning of the book <clears throat> about uh, question the resurrection is uh, Mark 16, the last 12 verses that are removed in the new versions. 
and says it's not there, and it's not there in one of the oldest and best manuscripts. And so they're looking at that as that as if you know, okay, then uh, you know the resurrection. You know, John and Luke and uh, Matthew all had it. Mark didn't have it. I wonder why. You know, and so they're using all these things here to try and discredit the re the uh, resurrection of Christ. And if they could do that, they definitely would do that. But of course, they can't do that. But anyway, that's 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 just uh, y'all read the, read those books. They're really good. Paul Meyer. Uh, here's a. Uh, Lord Chalcedoth, he's the Chief Justice of England, or was. He says, My faith began with and was grounded on what I thought was revealed in the Bible. When particularly I came to the New Testament, the Gospels and other writings of the men who had been friends of Jesus Christ seemed to me to make an overwhelming case, merely as a matter of strict evidence, for the fact therein stated. The same approach to the cardinal test of the claims of Jesus Christ, namely his resurrection, has led me, as often as I have tried to examine the evidence, to believe it as a fact beyond dispute. That's the Lord Chief Justice of England. Um, here's some legal authorities. Let me mention this too. Um, as uh, atheists and Christians debate these things, um, of course the atheists and the skeptics are trying to get us to disbelieve the Bible, trying to discredit the Word of God and the history of it and stuff. Um, I think we have more uh, we have more credible uh, evidence to back up the Bible now than had 100 or 200 years ago or 300 years ago. Uh, several hundred years ago when, uh, <clears throat> what was his name, um, um, the eighth, Thomas Paine uh, and some of those men uh, wrote against the Bible. A lot of their arguments was that uh, uh, the Bible uh, wasn't true historically or archaeologically. Uh, according to archaeology or history or whatever, uh, the, the claims of the Bible, a lot of them hadn't been proven. And at that time, some things hadn't been proven outside of the Bible. Um, there was the Hittites, uh, one of the largest uh, um, uh, cultures and uh, kingdoms uh, back in Old Testament times. Um, they said they couldn't find evidence of it. So therefore, the Bible's not true. Uh, back in Daniel, you've got uh, Nebuchadnezzar and then Belshazzar becomes king. Uh, they couldn't find evidence of Belshazzar that he was ever king. Um, and so they said, you know, you can't prove that, you can't prove this, you can't prove that, you can't prove the other thing. So therefore, you know, the Bible's not true. That, that's one of their arguments. Well, now, let, you're, 200 years after some of these guys have died, uh, they discovered the Hittites. They discovered uh, that Belshazzar was a king. Uh, they discovered um, um, many other things that were questioned back then. So if you were a person who believed the Bible 200 years ago and these arguments came up, you had to have a lot of faith to say, you know what, I believe what the Bible says regardless of what the atheists and the skeptics say, the archaeologists say, the historians say, I believe what it says. Uh, it's easier to believe the Bible now than it was 200 years ago because we know we have evidence that backs up the historical parts of the Bible, the archaeological evidence, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so they didn't need it 200 years ago, uh, but then they didn't, they didn't have a lot of the... Um, uh, well, they didn't have a lot of the, a lot of the uh, uh, militant, atheistic, and skeptic people trying to destroy uh, our faith and the faith of our kids and grandkids. But anyway, um, here's a, a legal authority, Dr. Simon Greenleaf. Uh, he was the Royal Professor of Law at Harvard University. He's a Harvard lawyer, um, and um, he succeeded... Uh, Joseph Story, who was a justice on the Supreme Court, uh, as the professor of law, uh, I believe at uh, Harvard or another place. I can't tell from what he's saying here. But anyway, uh, the rise of Harvard Law School to its eminent position among the legal schools in the United States today is to be ascribed to the efforts of these two men, Joseph Story, uh, a justice on the Supreme Court, and Simon Greenleaf. Uh, Greenleaf produced his famous three-work three-volume work, a treatise on the law of evidence, which still is considered one of the greatest single authorities on the subject in the entire literature of legal procedure. That is, how uh, the laws of evidence are to be used in courts. So, it still has an effect today. And he only wrote it over probably 150 years ago. Um, anyway, um, you heard the joke about Harvard. How do you become president of the United States? You go to Harvard and turn left. <laughs> uh, 
So anyway, um, Greenleaf examined the value of the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ to ascertain the truth. He applied the principles contained in his three-volume treatise on evidence. His findings were recorded in his book, An Examination of the Testimony of the Four Evangelists, by the Rules of Evidence Administered in the Courts of Justice. They had long titles back then, didn't they? So it's just an examination of the testimony of the four evangelists by Greenleaf. Um, I've got it. I've read it, gone through it, studied it out, and uh, it's an excellent book. Um, he came to the conclusion that according to the laws of legal evidence used in courts of law, there is more evidence for the historical fact of the resurrection of Christ than just about any other event in history. So there's a legal expert who wrote uh, the book on uh, the laws of evidence who comes out and says, you know what, uh, the resurrection of Christ is true. Um, then there's another guy, Frank Morrison. He wrote a book called Who Moved the Stone? Uh, he was a lawyer who had been brought up in a rationalistic environment. Uh, he'd come to the opinion that the resurrection was nothing but a fairy tale, a happy ending, which spoiled the matchless story of Jesus. He felt that he owed it to himself and to others to write a book that would present the truth about Jesus and dispel the myth of the resurrection. Upon studying the facts, however, he too came to a different conclusion. The sheer weight of the evidence compelled him to conclude that Jesus actually did rise from the dead. Morrison wrote a book, uh, again, uh, uh, who moved the stone? But he was going to write a book to refute the resurrection, but instead he came out writing a book that, uh, uh, that uh, 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 taught that the resurrection was true. Um, and so it's called Who Moved the Stone? You can still find that book. Uh, then there's uh, C.S. Lewis. He was the uh, professor of medieval and renaissance literature at Cambridge University. Um, and in writing about his conversion, he said this, um, um, he believed at the start that Christians were wrong, and then he goes on to say, the last thing Lewis wanted to embrace was Christianity. Uh, he was opposed to it, didn't believe it. Uh, however, quote, he says, early in 1926, uh, the hardest boiled of all atheists I ever knew sat in my room on the other side of the fire and remarked that the evidence for the historicity of the Gospels was really surprisingly good. Um, he went on, all that stuff of Frazier's about the dying God, it almost looks as if it really happened once. Uh, to understand the shattering impact of it, you would need to know the man who has certainly never since shown any interest in Christianity. Uh, if he, the cynic of cynics, the toughest of the toughs, were not, as I would still have put it, safe, where can I turn? Was there then no escape? Nobody saying this. He said the hardest uh, atheist that he's ever known uh, in private told him that there is a possibility the resurrection is true. But he uh, has no interest in Christianity or to learn anything about it. After evaluating the basis and evidence for Christianity, C.S. Lewis concluded that in other religions there was, quote, no such historical claim as in Christianity. Uh, his knowledge of literature forced him to treat the gospel record as a trustworthy account. I was by now too experienced in literary criticism to regard the gospels as myth. So there's a lot of people today that say the New Testament is myth. Uh, the life of Christ, the resurrection, all this stuff is a myth. It didn't really happen, didn't really take place. Uh, uh, the New Testament is not really a reliable document and this and that, whatever. Well, here's C.S. Lewis, the uh, professor of uh, medieval literature, at Cambridge saying, I studied it all out, and he said, my experience in literary criticism, I have to regard the Gospels not as myth, but as truth. So some people say, well, I disagree with him. He was wrong there. Well, C.S. Lewis would say that you are wrong if you disagree with him. So again, it just goes back to who you're going to believe. Um, contrary to his strong stand against Christianity, Lewis had to make an intelligent decision. Quote, you must picture me alone in that room, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him who I so earnestly desired not to meet. And he's talking about the Lord is dealing with him, and he didn't want anything to do with God. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God, and knelt and prayed. Uh, perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. So now, Lewis has got his theological problems. I don't know, 
He's a strange character. But he was an atheist who turned to believing in God, uh, claimed that he became a Christian, and then wrote uh, uh, many books in uh, support and defense of the Christian faith. Um, I read one place, and I misunderstood it when I did it, but I said he, he had made the comment. He said, I came to God as a, uh, how do you put it, rebellious, um, you know, had to be dragged, you know, to the point of conversion, this and that, or whatever. I can't remember how exactly he put it, but when I read it, I thought, that doesn't sound right. But now that I read this, I understand what he was saying. That is, he didn't want anything to do with Christianity. He didn't want to admit it was true, but God was dealing with him, and he had to, at one point, make up his mind that, uh, God was God. And when he did that, he uh, claims he was converted when he prayed to God that night. And again, he turned from being an atheist to being a Christian and uh, supporting and believing in the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, so that's just some people there uh, that have written things that are people who are credible, educated, degreed, etc. Uh, and the only thing that anybody can say against those people is that they just disagree with them and they'll say all kinds of stuff. You quote all kinds of people. Even Carl Sagan uh, said at one point, he said that he was not an atheist. Um, he didn't believe in God, but uh, there was the possibility of God. And he said this, he said, uh, he said, there is no compelling evidence that there is no God. What he said. He said, there's no compelling evidence that there is no God. He said, therefore, I can't say that I'm an atheist. Um, and then I quoted that to some people because Sagan is like one of the high priests of atheism and evolution and stuff. And uh, they'll say, well, you know, you, you can quote him all you want to, but he said this. Yeah, he said that, but he said this too. And uh, so they, 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 they'll, deny any, they'll deny anything they can to deny God and the, and the Christian faith. That's exactly what they'll do. Uh, so here's these men that uh, some of them came from an atheistic background and uh, mindset, and they came to believing in the Bible and the resurrection of Christ. And the resurrection is what they said was the key thing. Why? Because that's what the resurrection rests on. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 which is really the chapter um, on the resurrection of Christ. And we know what he says here, but here's um, Paul's arguments here about the resurrection. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? In other words, dead people don't come up. They're never resurrected. You go to the ground, you're dead, that's it. You go back to the dust, you're not coming back. He said, if Christ rose from the dead, that's what, if we preach that Christ rose from the dead, then you have to believe that you know, people are going to rise one day again at the resurrection. Uh, verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? So if you believe that dead people can't rise again and face God in judgment or reward, whatever it might be, then we can't believe that Christ rose either. But if Christ did rise from the dead, he's saying that, you know, we will rise again also. And that's really our hope. Our hope is not, our, our hope as Christian people, saved people, is the resurrection. Uh, we're not just going to go on the ground and be done with it and be, you know, annihilated or go into nothingness. We're actually going to uh, come back up and we're going to be in heaven and our new bodies and things like that. But look at verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, okay, so if Christ didn't rise from the dead, even though we preach he did, then our preaching is vain. Uh, it's futile. It's empty. It's worthless. Uh, and your faith also is vain. So if, the, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, literally, then your faith is vain. So if you go to a church that believes the resurrection of Christ was not literal but only a spiritual thing or only symbolic or whatever, then you're wasting your time going to that church. Uh, it's vain. Verse 15. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Paul says me and Peter and the rest of the apostles, we're found to be false witnesses if Christ did not rise from the dead. Why? Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You're yet in your sins. They all, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ, that is, uh, died in Christ, are perished. Um, 
They've just gone back to the dirt. Or the parish could be referenced to eternal hell as well. Uh, verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. That is, uh, if um, Christ didn't rise from the dead and we're believing this fairy tale, then uh, we're miserable people. We're, uh, we, we don't know it. Uh, we're, we're people that need to be pitied and look, looked down upon and, you know, uh, uh, just pitied for what we believe because what we believe isn't true. Uh, but the fact is, look at verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead? So Paul says, you know, here's, what, here's the case of Christ didn't rise from the dead. Verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man, that'd be Adam, came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So, he makes the argument there that without the resurrection, uh, we have no Christian faith. So it's got to be true, and if it's not true, then again, our faith would be vain. Um, now, look at some other things here. Um, Christ actually predicted his um, resurrection on the third day. Uh, throughout the four Gospels, Christ mentions these things, and they're written down and recorded. <clears throat> um, look at Matthew chapter um, 16. Matthew chapter 16. And verse 21. Now here in Matthew 16 is where um, he and the disciples are uh, talking amongst themselves and um, he asks them, who do you think I am? And Simon Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Look at verse 21. From that time, let's see, um, yeah, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples. So from the time that uh, God the Father revealed to the disciples that Jesus was the Christ. He says here, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples um, how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So there he's prophesying his coming death. Look at uh, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Uh, Mark chapter 8. And look here at um, verse uh, 31. And again, here is the same scene in the previous verses. Verse 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders, and of the chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. All right, look at uh, Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 9. And uh, again, uh, the same uh, scene here. And right after that, verse number 22, uh, well, look what he says here in verse number um, 20. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And he, Jesus Christ, straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. Verse 22, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. So, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all uh, state that Jesus Christ said and predicted his own death. Um, look at John chapter 2. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse number... Um, 18. John chapter 2 and verse number 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, unto Jesus, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, 
and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So here uh, they want a sign, and he's speaking, I guess you could use the word cryptically in some way. He says here, uh, uh, the sign is going to be this, I'm going to destroy this temple, in three days I'll raise it up. And they think he's talking about the temple. Uh, well, here's one way of looking at this, and that is the this and that thing here. Uh, this is this. That's that over there, right? Here he's standing at the temple. He's probably referring to himself. He is referring to himself when he says this temple. This, I'm going to destroy this temple. That's what he's, that's what he's inferring there. Uh, and the Bible tells you that's what he meant. But they mistook what he said. Um, again, many times he spoke in parables. Why? So that those who were blind wouldn't see and those who wanted to see couldn't see. Um, look at John, I think it's John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Um, where he said, where, where the, uh, they're reviling him on the cross. Um, and they say, he that said he's going to raise the temple. Or, yeah, rebuild the temple or whatever. Raise the temple. Um, is that there someplace? If somebody can find where at the cross um, they said, uh, referring back to the thing in John 2, he that destroys the temple, raise it in raise it whatever days, uh, etc. Uh, if you can find that, let me know that when you get it. Um, and then, uh, moving on here, uh, we already looked at 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, again, the basis of Christianity is the historical fact of the resurrection of Christ. And without the resurrection of Christ, then our faith, again, is vain. And then, um, we're talking here about... Um, uh, the resurrection and being true and things like that. Um, and the, the atheist skeptical people will say this. They'll say that, you know, uh, um, your faith is just believing something that you don't know is true. Uh, you believe without evidence. Um, and that's not true. Um, I tried to explain to somebody here recently that uh, faith is not, and a Christian faith is not based on just what they would call a fairy tale or something. It's based on what the Bible says. Uh, it's based on the facts of uh, the resurrection and things like that. Uh, we believe in the creation because the Bible says so. We believe that the evidence um, in nature backs up what the Bible says. Um, we believe in the flood of Noah we believe because the Bible says so. And we believe also that all the facts uh, in geology and all these things uh, will lead you to believe that the flood took place. Uh, we believe in the resurrection of Christ because the Bible says so. And all the evidence the Bible presents um, uh, when taken all together uh, proves the resurrection of Christ. It doesn't disprove it. So um, when we talk about faith, we're talking about really an intelligent faith. We're not talking about, uh, you know, an unintelligent faith. We're not talking about ignorant faith. We're not talking about we just believe this because we were brought up to believe this. Uh, and we're taught this as kids and stuff like that. No, we believe it because uh, the Bible says so. The Lord convicted us of it. And as we said the Bible, it just confirms our faith. So our faith is based on something that's intelligent, intelligent faith. Um, so um, when an individual in the scriptures uh, is called upon to exercise faith, it has to do with intelligent faith. You need to know what you're doing. Uh, Jesus said you should know the truth and the truth will make you free. Um, look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Um, many people think, just want to dismiss Christianity because they think that we uh, don't examine evidence. We don't believe in evidence. Uh, uh, we believe against evidence and this and that and whatever. Sometimes we do believe without evidence. But the fact is, most of our belief is faith based on uh, what the Bible says. And the Bible has been proven to be true. Therefore, our faith rests on, you know, what Hebrews 11 calls substance and evidence. I'll look at Matthew 22 here. And look at um, verse number um, 34. Uh, but when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, 
They were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy what? Mind. Mind. So you're supposed to love him with your heart and your soul and your mind. God gave you a brain. He gave you a mind. Amen. And you take the brain. I don't know how the mind works. Uh, people say he lost his mind. He's gone out of his mind. Uh, what's that mean? Does that mean his brain disappeared and dissolved or something? No, he still got his brain. Just isn't working properly. When, you might, when the brain works properly, you have a mind, which is some kind of consciousness that isn't material. It's spiritual in some way. Um, and uh, the again, the atheists and skeptics want to get rid of all that. They don't believe in a soul. Yet here he says, here you got to love God with your heart and your soul and with your mind. So God doesn't uh, dismiss your mind. He wants. He doesn't want mind numbed robots, right? Uh, he doesn't want mind full of mush, like Rush used to say. Uh, he wants you to think um, and consider and to reason. And so throughout the Bible, God says, I want to reason with people. I want you to consider this and stuff. So we're considering, we're reasoning, um, we're alleging things, we're wanting people to think. Um, so God wants you to use your mind. Uh, uh, God hasn't called us to commit intellectual suicide when we believe on Christ and accepted the Bible as the Word of God. Um, and uh, when you got saved, you didn't, uh, you, you probably considered it. I bet you considered it before you got saved, didn't you? Didn't you consider the things of Christ and the things of God? Didn't, didn't thoughts go through your mind about, you know, well, you know, is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Is it real? Is it true? Did Jesus Christ really die for me and rise again from the dead? Uh, where am I going to spend eternity? Is there an eternity? Uh, what if I'm wrong about it and there is a hell? Uh, you considered and thought about all those things, probably many of you, before you got saved. And then you made an intelligent decision. Uh, to become a Christian. Um, that's what C.S. Lewis said he did. He said he made an intelligent decision about those things. Um, in other words, that's the, the smart thing to do is get saved, amen? That's the smart thing to do. Amen. Um, look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Look at this. 1 Peter 3 and uh, verse number 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Um, he says this. He said, when somebody asks you a question... You should be ready to give them an answer. Well, that requires some thought. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's more than just a yes or no question. Do you believe in God? Yes. Okay. Why do you believe in God? Okay. Then that, that's a little more involved there. It requires some thought. Um, well, you, you could say this. You could say, do you believe in God? Somebody asks you, do you believe in God? Yes. Why do you believe in God? Because the Bible says so. Well, how do you know the Bible's true? You have an answer for that? The financial is historical. Yes. There you go. Oh. Yeah. Um, I told somebody one time, uh, one, of the, one of the evidences of the Bible is uh, fulfilled prophecy. And, well, what's what fulfilled prophecy? Well, the, all the things involving Christ, for instance. Uh, all the things involving uh, uh, the restoration of Israel. Uh, many things in the Bible. Uh, the Bible is the only book, only religious book that I know of that prophesies anything. And all the prophecies eventually come true. Um, one guy, a guy named uh, Peter Stoner, he was a mathematician. You may have heard of that guy. Uh, he wrote a, he wrote some book. He wrote a book. You can find it online. Um, and he was a mathematician. And he did. He I think he studied like eight prophecies regarding the. Um, life and death of Christ. And he did a statistical probability formula and all this stuff. And he came to the conclusion that um, 
it, the chances of those uh, evidences taking place or those, those prophecies being fulfilled, just the eight, was, was astronomical. Like one to the times ten to the, I think, 157th power or something. And uh, then you uh, uh, take and uh, uh, look at the fact that there's actually, they say, scholars say, there's actually 333 prophecies um, that were fulfilled in the life and ministry, death and resurrection of Christ. Over 300. And so if those 300 came to pass, then based on that evidence, I can have faith that the other 500 that have to do with his second coming are going to come to pass too. So it's not just based on, you know, well, I just believe it. Well, I believe it, yes. And then as I study it more and more and more, my faith is reinforced in the Bible. And that's what church is supposed to do. That's what Bible study is supposed to do. It's supposed to reinforce your faith and belief in the Bible. What the schools and educators out there do is they're doing everything they can to tear down your faith. You need it reinforced. And so... Anyway, um, I was saying there that, um, what was I saying? What's the last thing I said there? Um, what's that? Reinforce your faith. Yeah, reinforce your faith. Um, I have to go with that thing. The mathematician guy. What is it? Oh, the mathematician guy. Yeah, that's it. That's it, yeah. So, um, the mathematician guy. So, he said that eight prophecies, I believe, were one times ten to the I thought it was the one fifty seven to look again. That's a lot of zeros. Um, and so if three hundred prophecies are fulfilled, that's a whole lot more than that. And you do you know how many um, electrons there are in the universe? Ten to the eightieth power. In the known universe, there's ten to the eightieth power Electrons. That's 10 followed by 80 zeros. The possibility of the prophecies concerning Christ's first coming are twice that. So that means that if you could go out there and say, here's all the electrons, right? Here's all the electrons in the universe. Here they all are. And we can't draw them all out there. But amongst all them, we're going to mark one of them. We're going to color it green. There it is. Now, if you can find that one in 1 times 10 to the 10 with eight, 80 zeros after, um, then that would be a miracle. But the fact is that there's more, a lot, there, there's more, uh, the odds against Props of the Bible being true are more than the electrons in the universe. That's quite a thing. Um, so anyway, um, I, I did this too. That is, uh, I, I've seen this before. And yeah, you know those cipher locks. You know those cipher locks where you have like, um, you know, you have four little things you turn, and there's there's ten numbers on it, right? Um, I looked at that, and if you have one that has Four, four uh, uh, cylinders that turn, and they've got uh, ten numbers, zero through nine, right? That's ten numbers. So that would be ten <laughs> to the fourth power. That's ten thousand. In other words, when you talk about ten to the fourth power, you're talking about a one followed by four zeros. Okay? So that's 10,000 combinations with four cylinders in a lock, like a bicycle lock or something, right? Or you lock a computer up with it. So let's say we give you 24 hours, and, you can, and we give you, you you're going to be re drinking your Red Bull and all the stuff, you can stay awake and alert your coffee, and you got 24 hours to find the combination. There's 10,000 options. you got to find the right one. If you get the right one, you win a million dollars. You think you could win a million dollars? You'd be awfully lucky if you did. But that's just ten thousand. Uh, we say it, if we take it, if you get, if you say you've got six um, cylinders, 
That would be one, two, three, four, five, six. That'd be one million. So if you've got six cylinders, that'd be one million. Uh, the chance is one in a million you'd get it right. Here's a good way to look at it. If we just did that, let's say this, let's say this. Let's say if you can find the right combination out of a million in 24 hours, you get to go to heaven. <laughs> and if you can, you go to hell. How many is going to heaven? <laughs> Brother David said he's going to get it. <laughs> I got the express ticket. Oh, okay. <laughs> but if that was the case, you would be going to hell. So here I have the prophecies of the Bible and the prophecies of the Bible that came true so far, the odds against that happening are more than the electrons in the universe. Ever held a pencil whether or not you believe that the Bible's true? You're going to lose if you don't believe the Bible. And so, anyway, the fact that 300 prophecies came true, again, is like, okay, that's pretty good evidence. I can probably believe that. No doubt you could. Um, and your eternity depends on what you believe about. So anyway, uh, we're talking about an intelligent faith. And faith is not something we just uh, work up or make up or just we just believe because somebody told us that. Uh, we believe it because the Scripture says so. And again, why do we believe what the Scripture says is true? Well, we can use the Bible to prove the Bible. They hate that. You can't prove the Bible to prove the Bible. Well, we can through prophecy. Bible prophecies. 300 in the life of Christ came to pass. That's the odds against that are more than a million. It's probably, you know, like I said, one times ten with, you know, 300 zeros after it or something. So, we've got a pretty good strong case that the Bible is true because of the prophecies recurring concerning Christ. So, if those are all true, then I think I can believe what Jesus said. That he's the way, the truth, and the life. And that no man comes to the Bible but by him. Only one way to heaven, that's through Christ. So, all the things the Bible says about him are true. And so we accept the resurrection also. And again, we're going to look at the evidences for that uh, that's in the Bible. And we'll see what uh, the Bible says about it. And uh, uh, we'll examine all that and see that um, everything in there, uh, like all these men we just quoted a while ago, lawyers, justices, um, scientists, professors, etc., said they've studied it all out and they believe that the resurrection is true according to what the Bible says. So we've got solid foundation for what we believe in. Okay, we'll stop there.